Virginia waters. I think her town is also somewhere there, but in Scotland, not in England. Dr. Sizer did his PhD in the history and theology of Christian Zionism and has published two books and several monographs on the topic. He's a frequent lecturer across North Africa and in the Middle East on both Christian and Muslim issues. He is on the steering committee of the Friends of Sabil, UK, a Palestinian theological theology center in Jerusalem. He is passionate about justice, passionate about interreligious dialogue, and passionate about his faith in Christianity. Please welcome Dr. Reverend Stephen Seifer. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ayub and uh, Dr. Wagner, for the invitation to participate uh, in this dialogue. And I'm dedicating this paper to uh, Evelyn, uh, who, and I regret that we're not able to hear her presentation on this subject. Um, I'm not a specialist in Islamic studies. And uh, nor have I undertaken research in this subject until now. My own specialism uh, has been, as you've just heard, Christian Zionism, its history, theology, and politics. Uh, however, when I was asked to deputize for Evelyn, um, I took a crash course in the subject, and uh, you will, you will uh, experience the enthusiasm of a freshman writing his first essay. And I look forward to um, our uh, dialogue, and you will be able to make up for the deficiencies in this paper. First, an introduction, them and us. Uh, religions invariably classify people as uh, believers and unbelievers, them and us. We have the Goyim in Judaism, infidel in Christianity and Islam, uh, Melacha in Hinduism. Uh, this us-them paradigm is neither new nor unique uh, to Islam. Within Islam, Christians and Jews are designated uh, as people of the book and uh, given protected or subject status of dhimmi. The word means protection, care, custody, covenant of protection, responsibility, obligation, uh, security of life and property, safeguard, guarantee, security, conscience. Today there are between 12 and 15 million Christians in the Middle East alone living in uh, minority status, 4 to 5% of the population. Uh, the majority are Orthodox, we have the Catholic tradition, and the Protestants, and you have, I hope, the details uh, in the paper uh, in front of you if you want to read those figures more carefully. Clearly this subject is a controversial one, uh, and uh, strong uh, opinions are expressed on both sides. There are those within the Islamic community seem to be in denial of the uh, difficulties faced by Christian minorities, and then we have uh, those within the Christian and sometimes Jewish communities who seem to want to exaggerate and exacerbate the tensions for their own purposes. I'm going to give you a brief history of the development of uh, Dimmi status. I'm going to present the two contrasting interpretations, give an assessment and overview of the status of Christian minorities, and then offer, I hope, a middle way that neither ignores the anxieties of Christian minorities nor demonizes the Muslim majorities for the tensions that exist between the two faith communities. Among friends, I hope we can be honest and open and vulnerable, and I ask your forgiveness in advance, not least for my pronunciation of Arabic terms. Christian minorities under Muslim rule, the historical development of demi status. As the early Muslims expanded their territory, they imposed terms of surrender on those defeated nations and tribes. The imposition of uh, tax uh, upon those who fell under Muslim rule was based on Surah 929. Uh, fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold forbidden that which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger. Nor acknowledge the religion of truth, even if they are the people of the book until they pay the jizya uh, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. The supposed code or pact of Ummah is another source. Uh, in return for toleration and protection from Muslim rulers, 
these are the requirements laid down for Jews and Christians. I take this from Colin Chapman's uh, fine book. All non-Muslim males must pay the poll tax to the Muslim state as an expression of their submission to Muslim rule. Non-Muslims could not engage in military service since this would involve them in jihad. Jews and Christians are not allowed to build new churches or synagogues or repair those occupied by Muslims. Not allowed to display the cross outside churches or hold public religious processions. Their homes could not be built taller than those of Muslims. Their clothes should be different from those worn by Muslims unless they wore a badge to mark them out. Forbidden to ride on horses, they had to ride on mules or donkeys. And they were required to show respect to Muslims, for instance, by giving up their seats. The Muslim historian Balad Duri, writing in the 9th century, draws parallels between the dhimmi status and uh, Byzantine legislation describing the Jews as the dhimmis of the Christians. Michael uh, Nazar Ali uh, points out in many parts of the Muslim uh, the world, Muslim rule succeeded theocratic Byzantine imperialism, and it's paradoxical that the Byzantine church itself became subject to those provisions when they became part of the Muslim legislation on the Dhimmi. Kenneth Craig uh, goes on to explain the terms under which Dhimmis could live under Islamic rule. The tolerance was in theory and practice a strict <coughs> contractual relationship. Theoretically, life was forfeit for non-Muslims but could be reprieved by the agreement to submit politically. At any point, the contract to protect could be suspended if, in the judgment of the Muslim power, its conditions had been broken. In practice, the minorities, dhimmis in the state of al dhimma had reasonable security. The sword of Damocles remained but need not ever fall. In concept and largely in practice, however, it allowed Christians of any persuasion, as monotheists and scriptured people, to maintain their own worship, teach their own offspring, administer their own laws. In return for protection, they paid a tax and were exempt as non-Muslims from the zakat, or alms. Thus, separation was institutionalized in a form of effective, effectively making the minorities inferior as non-citizens. Their submission in these terms was the legal basis for the suspension of jihad, the obligation to subdue non-Islam by force incumbent on Dar al-Islam as such. Now the status of Christians living under Muslim rule has typically been interpreted in two ways, denial and demonization. Komaraswamy, the uh, Indian uh, uh, academic, points out that the most severe and immediate problem facing minorities is the denial of their existence. It operates at both the theological and the political level. He says there are powerful trends among contemporary Islamic scholars to defend and portray the glorious and benevolent treatment of minorities living under Islamic rule. In their assessment, the dhimmi was and continues to be the ideal framework for minorities. For example, Muhammad Hamadullah claimed if Muslim residents in non-Muslim countries receive the same treatment as dhimmi in the Islamic world, they would be more than satisfied. They would be grateful. On this sensitive issues, Islamic scholars tend to focus on the teaching of the Quran toward minorities rather than address the practices of Islamic rulers towards them. He says it is essential to distinguish tolerance from equality. Religious tolerance, personal protection, conditional communal security in return for the allegiance to the Islamic rule is very different from equality. But if the tendency among some Muslims is to deny that there is a problem, the opposite tendency is prevalent among certain Christian and Jewish circles, whether intentionally or otherwise exaggerates those tensions. Probably the most outspoken critic of the way Islam has handled minority faith communities uh, is, uh, is the, uh, the writer Bat Yor and her books, uh, the Dhimmi and the Decline of Eastern Christianity under Islam. I believe she coined the phrase dimitude in uh, 1983. Uh, 
ostensibly seeking to provide uh, an assessment of the condition of Christian minorities living under Muslim rule, uh, she describes this process as one of dimitude. She goes on in her book, uh, Islam and Dimitude, to write, uh, Jihad divides the people of the world into two irreconcilable groups. Dar al-Islam, uh, al region subject to Islamic law and infidels, inhabitants of Dar al-Harb, the territory of war, destined to come under Islamic jurisdiction, either by the conversion of its inhabitants or by armed conflict. And not surprisingly, her writings have been severely criticized. Robert Betts, the American historian, observes the general tone of her books is strident and anti-Muslim, coupled with selective scholarship designed to pick out the worst examples of anti-Christian behavior by Muslim governments. Add to this the attempt to demonize the so-called Islamic threat to Western civilization, and the end product, product is generally unedifying and frequently irritating. Uh, Ahmad, uh, sorry, Imad Ahmed, uh, in his, uh, of the Minaret Freedom Institute, criticizes your second book as a Zionist project. He says it differs little, uh, has little to offer serious scholarship of Islam, or of the world's civilizations. It has much to offer propagandists who seek rhetorical ammunition to increase rather than decrease the hatred and strife of the world. And in the UK, uh, we are currently uh, uh, experiencing a similar debate over the writings of Canon Dr. Patrick Sadeo, uh, founder of the Institute for the Study of Islam and Christianity and the Barnabas Fund. His most recent book, Global Jihad, The Face of uh, the future of the face of militant Islam has aroused uh, considerable controversy. Uh, one commentator, Ben White, writes, the core of uh, his analysis is that violence and domination is intrinsic to classical Islam and that the terrorists are above all theologically rather than politically motivated. In order to make this case, he ends up distorting and simplifying Islamic theology. There are many others that I've encountered in my work on Christian Zionism. Uh, Joel Richardson, Dave Hunt, Walid Shuba, for example, and our good friend Melanie Phillips. Uh, their writings are highly critical of Islam generally and specifically of evangelical Christian Muslim dialogue in particular. They endorse instead an exclusive Zionist claim to both Christian patronage as well as Palestine. So what is the status, the contemporary status of Christian minorities? Well, we don't have time to trace the historical development uh, of the uh, decline of demi status uh, and uh, the removal of uh, the, uh, the poll tax. It has much to do with uh, Western imperial interests in the Middle East, uh, notably uh, Britain's uh, presence in Egypt, and uh, the negotiations between Britain, France, and Austria uh, and their involvement in the Crimea War. Historically, the Middle East uh, has uh, an unenviable un un record of external interventions on behalf of uh, the minority populations, especially Dimi. We have not only the decline of the Ottoman Empire, uh, Kenneth Cragg uh, writes extensively on that, but Western imperialism, for example, the removal of Dimi status in Egypt in 1923 was preceded by the Egyptian recognition of the British right to protect Egyptian minorities. Uh, Kenneth Cragg summarizes the issue as European commercial and later political interest developed in the Arab areas, the Christian communities came under suspicion and duress because of their stake whether for faith or for profit, in the European factor. There is, thirdly, uh, the, uh, the rise of the nationalist and autonomous tendencies within Christian minorities themselves. The Maronites in Lebanon, the Assyrians in uh, the Fertile Crescent, the Nubians in the Nile Valley, the Copts in Egypt, the Syriacs in northern Syria. And the final factor, uh, impacting the status of Christian minorities living under Muslim rule 
is the existence of the State of Israel, the denial of Palestinian rights, and most significantly, Western Christian support for Zionism. Uh, there is uh, much evidence of the uh, involvement of the early Zionists in identifying, patronizing, and exploiting the internal divisions and diversities within the non-Jewish communities in the Middle East. And the willingness of some of the minority groups to seek out political support from Israel has not only worked against their interests, but has made them suspicious vis-a-vis -vis their Arab governments and majority populations. Um, Open Doors advocates on behalf of Christian minorities, and uh, if you were with us uh, last year, Brother Andrew, the founder of Open Doors, participated in our, uh, our consultation in Libya. But Open Doors ranks uh, nationalities, countries around the world, on the basis of the intensity of persecution uh, of Christians uh, in their countries. And of the top 50 countries, uh, apart from the first, North Korea, China, 12th, Vietnam, 23rd, and non-Muslim countries, India, 22nd, Burma, 24th, Kenya, 49th. The others, the other 41, are, uh, are countries where we have uh, a Muslim majority. Saudi Arabia is ranked second. Public worship, uh, non-Muslim worship is forbidden. The risk of arrest, imprisonment, flogging, deportation, and sometimes torture. In Iran, there has been a significant crackdown in house churches since 2008. More than 50 Christians are known to have been arrested and interrogated uh, in the last year. And uh, it is still uh, uh, legal in, uh, in Iran for men to be found guilty of converting from Islam uh, to face a mandatory death sentence. In Afghanistan, the 2004 constitution states no law can be contrary to the beliefs and provisions of Islam. Most Christians there are secret believers. Somalia, a tiny number of ethnic uh, Somali Christians practice their faith in secret under extremely dangerous conditions. At least 10 have been killed for their faith in 2008. And uh, we received a report two days ago from, uh, from Pakistan uh, to the effect that the Taliban is now demanding the reintroduction of the dizzy attacks on minorities in the northern areas of Pakistan. Christian minorities and apostasy. The issue which brings uh, the tensions faced by Christian minorities into sharpest focus is the issue of conversion and apostasy. Because how religions treat those who wish to change their faith is a measure of how they treat those minorities generally. Christian Solidarity Worldwide uh, published a report in 2008 that no place to call home experiences of apostasy from Islam provides a detailed and comprehensive analysis of the consequences of Muslims becoming Christians. And I won't go into detail into that report, but I commend it to you and simply uh, highlight uh, the example of two uh, young Christian ladies in Iran today, Mazia and Mariam, were arrested a month ago, and their only crime was they are committed Christians. They have been unfairly labeled as involving anti-government activity, and they are presently uh, interred in the Evin prison, where they're being held without charge. Uh, I'm visiting Iran next month, and I'll be advocating on their behalf with the authorities. Let me wrap this up. I've lost all concept of time. Uh, you have done two minutes. Thank you. Let me summarize what we've uh, explored uh, rather superficially, I know. International law is based around the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and Article 18 affirms that everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion, or belief and freedom, either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance. Islamic declarations have been built on this foundation, most notably the Universal Islamic Declaration of Human Rights, 1981, the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights in Islam, 1990, the Arab Charter on Human Rights, 1994. 
the question we face is how can we strengthen these declarations and ensure the consistent implementation. As Christians, Christians present, we must begin by putting our own house in order. Andrew White, who founded the uh, Foundation for Relief and Reconciliation in the Middle East, uh, uh, known as the Vicar of Baghdad, said recently, we all need to realize that all religion has power, either it can create something beautiful or destroy, in all this work, I simply keep thinking of the words of Jesus, to love your enemies. In Christ, those you hate can become your friends, and they do. I am very encouraged that as long ago as 1980, the Lausanne Committee on World Evangelization, representing evangelicals worldwide, published a report on Christian witness to Muslims in which they acknowledged we have no right to point the finger of accusation at Muslim communities and governments if we are blind to the way in which Muslim minorities suffer from unfair discrimination in so-called Christian countries in the West. Christians in this kind of situation are called to take seriously the words of the Mosaic Law, you shall not oppress the alien, for you know how it feels to be an alien. You were alien to yourselves in Egypt. We also need to take very seriously Jesus' warnings about the danger of judging others. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the log in your own eye? hypocrite. Only if and when we have taken this warning seriously can we begin to draw attention to situations in the Muslim world in which Christian minorities feel that their religious freedoms are being threatened. Not only in subtle forms of discrimination but also new Islamic constitutions that affect the status of minorities. We urge Christian leaders in all walks of life to use their influence to encourage governments and business organizations to follow as far as possible in principle, do unto others what you want them to do for you. Last year, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia sponsored a world conference on dialogue in Madrid, Spain, and during that conference, uh, I was asked to participate in a, an Iranian press TV program with the chief rabbi of Vienna, an Islamic scholar in the United States. And you never know, he may be present, but I've forgotten his name, sadly. But in discussion, uh, uh, of the value of such conferences, I said that uh, most, uh, most dialogue, most interfaith dialogue, is uh, somewhat superficial because it does not address the three most fundamental rights of all. The right to express one's faith, the right to share one's faith, and the right to change one's faith. Our two faith communities are both missionary faiths. We welcome those who wish to embrace our faith. If our dialogue is to be authentic, constructive, and lasting in effect, we must respect and defend those three rights for each other, and not just for ourselves. Wherever we are living in the world, whether we are a majority or a minority. It's my hope and prayer that this evangelical Christian Muslim dialogue will contribute to the universal establishment of a climate where states and uh, societies generally meet their obligations to ensure the freedom of religion or belief for all. As Jesus said, so in everything do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up 